Good morning, class. This brief video is part three of the discussion on Sartre's work, Existentialism is a Humanism. The text I'll be using is this one right here, Existentialism is a Humanism uh, by Jean-Paul Sartre. And this is by uh, Yale University Press. All of the quotes I'll be using is from that text, in case you wanna follow along. Uh, we'll be beginning around page 31 and we'll be concluding around page 41 for, uh, for today. So let's review. Them. So as mentioned before, this will be a discussion on uh, Sartre's work, Existentialism is a Humanism, and this is uh, the third video on, on this discussion. So in the uh, former videos, we uh, looked at the concepts of um, existence precedes essence and how that leads to the notion that we are condemned to be free. And this has implications that we do not have moral guidance for our uh, actions, our moral actions. Sartre understands this situation to be a uh, state of abandonment. Normally, uh, when making moral decisions, there's varieties of avenues we can look to. Uh, and in the uh, last video, we looked at three of these avenues, religion, morality, and advice from others. In this um, video, we'll look at the two uh, remaining avenues. These are strength of feelings and science. And Sartre also does not think we can look to uh, these avenues for moral guidance. Again, uh, we have to just look to our own freedom and our own uh, decision making. After that, Sartre um, looks at the subjective nature of his existentialism, and he uses subjectivity as a point of departure. Uh, he sees there being an absolute truth in this subjectivity, and this will be the cogito, uh, which Descartes um, expresses in his meditations. But Sartre understands this uh, absolute truth, meaning truth based on nothing else but it, to be intersubjective in nature and universal in a qualified sense. Now we'll briefly look at uh, how Sartre understands this truth of the cogito, but for next time we'll look at his criticisms uh, that he addresses of the subjectivity of his existentialism, as well as how he understands the intersubjective nature of the cogito um, and how he sees it as universal in a qualified sense. So for um, review of the state of abandonment, which is um, the state Sart Sartre sees us to be in because of the uh, existence preceding essence and the um, uh, consequently the uh, uh, complete freedom and, and the idea that we are condemned to be free. He, we already reviewed uh, how we cannot look to uh, religion, moral imperatives and moral authority. Um, according to Sartre, uh, today we'll be looking at strength of feeling and science. Now all the first four examples he gives, he uses the larger moral dilemma example of one of his students who is trying to decide whether to stay home and take care of his mother or whether to uh, join the free French forces during uh, World War II. Uh, and we've explored uh, how religion, in the example of Christianity, moral imperative, in the example of the Kantian philosophy, and asking other people more authority for advice does not uh, prove fruitful according to Sartre in this situation. For strength of feeling, we will also utilize this example. Uh, but for science, he uses another example. He uses the example of a Jesuit that he met uh, while in prison and about how the Jesuit uh, individual decided to join the order. So that's a separate example. Um, Sartre finds that none of these um, avenues uh, will ultimately yield uh, results 
for guidance for moral decision making, and we are left to ourselves. So let's explore the strength of feeling. And this is the context of the student, again, who uh, is trying to decide whether to take care of his mother or to fight with the French free forces in World War II. And um, Sartre is quoting the student here. So the student is asking Sartre for advice. Sartre gives him no advice except saying that you have freedom. You decide who you want to be. You make your own decision. Here's what the student says. Quote, all things considered, it is feelings that matter. I should choose what truly compels me to follow a certain path. If I feel that I love my mother enough to sacrifice everything else for her, my desire for vengeance, my desire for action, my desire for adventure, then I should stay by her side. If to the contrary, I feel that my love for my mother is not strong enough, I should go. And this is on page 32 of the text. Uh, and then Sartre gives his reflection on why he doesn't think that this is really a coherent way of looking at the uh, moral decision. Sartre says, he responds in the following way, also on page 32. But how can we measure the strength of feeling? What gave any value to the young man's feeling for his mother? Precisely the fact that he chose to stay with her. I may say I love my friend well enough to sacrifice a certain sum of money for his sake, but I can only claim that if I have done so. I can say that I love my mother enough to stay by her side only if I actually stayed with her. The only way I can measure the strength of this affection is precisely to perform the action that confirms and defines it. However, since I am depending on this affection to justify my action, I find myself caught in a vicious circle. According to Sartre, the, feel, the strength of feeling regarding an action can only be measured after the action is performed and therefore cannot be used as a guide for whatever one should perform, for whether one should perform the action. As Sartre will later go on to say that we basically are only our actions and so we can't, we can't measure things by what we think we might feel. It's only through performing the action that we understand the strength of the feeling. And so we can't rely on strength of feeling in advance, particularly to decide whether we should perform one particular moral action or another. So we'll move on now to the final um, avenue, which is science. And uh, Sartre does not believe we can turn to signs for guidance concerning moral decision making because we ultimately are we are ultimately the interpreters of the signs or events and therefore freely decide how to interpret the signs. So we can't just say a sign is saying something objectively. We are the subjective interpreters of the signs, and we ultimately interpret the science based on our freedom to interpret them one way or another. And Sartre tries to demonstrate this by the example of a Jesuit he met while in a German prison camp. And so this is him talking about the individual who decided to, to uh, join the uh, order of Jesuits. Sartre speaking, and this is on page 33, 34. Um, when I was in a German prison camp, I met a rather remarkable man who happened to be a Jesuit. This is how he came to join the order. He had experienced several frustrating setbacks in his life. His father died while he was still a child, leaving him in poverty, but he was awarded a scholarship to a religious institution where he was constantly reminded that he had been accepted only out of charity. He was subsequently denied a number of distinctions and honors that would have pleased any child. Then about, then when he was about 18 years old, he had an unfortunate love affair that broke his heart. Finally, at the age of 22, what should have been a trifle was actually the last straw. He flunked out of military training school. This young man had every right to believe he was a total failure. It was a sign, but a sign of what? Sartre continues on page 34. He could have sought refuge in bitterness or despair. Instead, and it was very clever of him, 
he chose to take it as a sign he was not destined for secular success, success and that his achievements would be attained only in the realms of religion, sanctity, and faith. He saw in all of this a message from God, and so he joined the order. But who can doubt that he, the meaning of the sign was determined by him and by him alone? We might have concluded something quite different from this set of reversals. For example, he might have been better off training to be a carpenter or a revolutionary. He therefore bears the full responsibility for the interpretation of the sign. This is what abandonment implies. It is we ourselves who decide who we want to be. And so with this interpretation of science and this particular example of the variation of interpretations the Sartre says or explains this was available to the individual, the sign is uh, mediated by one's freedom. And therefore one's interpretation is done in perfect freedom. And therefore Sartre says, it's not the sign that is uh, being relied upon, but one's freedom to interpret the sign in any way one chooses. And therefore one cannot rely upon signs per se, because signs are merely the uh, result of the interpretation of our freedom applied to our life. So to recap the existential situation, the first four squares are what we have gone through so far. What I've underlined is what we're going next. So first Sartre uh, has explained in this particular lecture that existence precedes essence, which is to say we have no predetermined nature. Second, Sartre explains as a result of this that we are condemned to be freed, which is to say we have no avenues for moral guidance. And this situation is understood for Sartre as a state of abandonment. Um, a result of this and of the existentialist in general is that we humans only exist in our actions and we bear full responsibility for our actions. Uh, we can't say that we are more than our actions. But now Sartre is, uh, seeks to both answer objections to his existentialism while basing his position on truth. And these objections and this truth has to do with subjectivity. Uh, Sartre finds that absolute truth, i.e. truth based on nothing else but itself, is the Cartesian cogito, cogito ergo sum, which is translated as I think therefore I am, which he explains is both subjective and intersubjective in nature. And the intersubjective aspect is something that Descartes did not address in his meditations. Rather, Descartes found more grounding for the subjective in the objective through an ontological argument, actually two ontological arguments for the existence of God. So where Descartes uh, moved from the subjectivity to the objectivity of God, Sartre will move from the subjectivity of the uh, subjective to the inner subjective. And this is, we'll be discussing this uh, more in the uh, next uh, lecture discussion video. So the cogito uh, Descartes comes to in his meditations after he doubts um, everything he can possibly doubt. He's looking for a foundational epistemology. He finds that the one thing he cannot doubt is that he's doubting. Uh, doubt for Descartes is generalized into a form of thinking and therefore he concludes that he is a thinking thing. He thinks, therefore, I am. He is, uh, or I think, therefore, I am, which is for both Descartes and for uh, Sartre an absolute truth. And this is a subjective position. If we recall in Descartes' meditations at this point, he doesn't have proof of anything else. He just has proof that he is a thinking thing. He has no proof of the external world, that he has a body. It's just his subjective thoughts. Uh, Sartre uses this as a point of departure for his existential philosophy, but he wants to argue that um, this subjective position is really um, a uh, indication of intersubjective nature. And this is what we'll be looking into more in the next video.
So Sartre explains, contrary to the philosophy of Descartes or of Kant, Kant kind of built on this with the unity of a perception as the self. Uh, when I say I think, we, when we say I think, we each attain ourselves in the presence of the other and we are just as certain of the other as we are of ourselves. Therefore, the man who becomes aware of himself directly in the cogito also perceives all others. And he does so as a condition of his own existence. So this is what we'll look at in the, uh, in the next um, discussion, how Sartre goes from this subjective point of departure to this intersubjectivity, which he finds is just as apparent in a statement like the Cochito. And also because of the intersubjectivity, he finds a nuanced or qualified sense of universality of all human beings sort of in this intersubjective subjective condition. So we'll look at this next time. And we will also look at, uh, there's a variety of criticism Sartre is going to object, uh, address concerning the subjective nature of his um, particular existentialism. So I hope this was helpful. And if you have any uh, questions about this, uh, feel free to email me or to uh, leave a message on the panels. Thank you.